All right, let's get started. It's a pleasure today to welcome Sertaj Karaman <coughs> to our Dream Seminar. Welcome, Sertaj. Sertaj is a professor at MIT um, in uh, LIDS, um, an aeroastro, aeroastro at MIT, um, where he's been a professor for about um, Six years? Six years. Six now. years. Six, yeah. years yeah. six years. Five and a half. Um, he did his PhD at MIT and his master's at MIT, uh, working with Emilio Frazzoli, who's the latest um, billionaire or half billionaire um, because, of his, yeah, um, <laughs> because of uh, Newtonomy. Yeah. Um, but um, Sertaj has um, stayed in academia and has um, uh, has a background in um, control and robotics and has worked a lot in um, stochastic processes and um, and modeling of uh, robotic systems and um, and then has a lot of uh, excitement in um, you know real live lab systems. So he's a UAV lab and he works on autonomous cars and he's also developed a number of courses which we've been watching and I learned today about the outreach to high school that mm -hmm. he's been doing with these courses. So a lot of excitement going on there. Uh, what Sertaj is going to talk about today focuses on um, his experience and thoughts about how um, these algorithms tie into actually actually designing kind of the next generation of embedded computing for robotics. Um, and Sertach has won a number of awards, um, uh, Robotics and Automation uh, Early Career Award, a yeah, Young Investigator Award. I think it's called the Early Career yeah, Award. Yeah, and an ONR likewise, and NSF likewise, yeah. all the kind of great Young Investigator Awards. So thank you for coming, Sertach, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thanks, Claire, for the introduction. Thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure uh, to be at Berkeley. I think I was here last two years ago or so, so uh, it's been really great catching up with uh, people I know and, and, and meeting with some of the new students um, and faculty. Uh, so as Claire said earlier, so I'd like to kind of focus a little bit more of the talk on some of the new work that we're doing. Uh, it's, I'm going to focus, I'm going to talk about three different things. Uh, hopefully time will allow. Uh, and they're all about computing, especially for aerospace embedded systems. So embedded systems that have aerospace applications and the aerospace lens and flavor that I'll try to tell you about. Uh, I'll talk both about sort of how do we use large scale offline computing resources, for example, to compute controllers from the ground up. I'll also talk about onboard computing systems. I'll get to both of them. There's a lot of motivation for these things. I'll talk about one motivation that I'm sure all of you are excited about. Um, so I'm gonna, I usually ask who's familiar with drone racing and I see almost everyone often kind of familiar with. And so here you're seeing um, a person flying a drone, a remotely piloted. This camera image is beamed back to a person. This person is looking at the camera image from the goggles and steering the drone this fast in this complicated environment. When I look at something like this as a roboticist, it looks to me like this is almost impossible. It'd be great if we could accomplish something like this, um, but I think we're still quite a bit far away from being able to navigate this fast in an environment this complicated. However, when I think about it, you know, now that uh, better sensors are coming in, better computers are coming in, we may be able to get to a point where we can do this even faster. For example, install some onboard supercomputers, install very high rate cameras, and use them together with new types of algorithms, and maybe be able to do this even faster, even better than what humans can do. That would be cool. Um, you might ask, so great, uh, so that sounds like a lot of fun, so what are some of the applications? Uh, one application certainly is around um, kind of security aspects of this. So I look at this as a roboticist, I get very excited. Uh, but if you do some work with like, for example, DOD or defense companies, they look at these things and they, they get terrified because they feel like you know, people can pilot these things and the drones could be malicious. And so um, how could we deal with this from a security problem? So I, I found this on the internet. It turns out the Netherlands police actually is training eagles. You can see a drone that has some duct tape on it, so it must have crashed several times. Apparently they're training eagles so that they can take some drones off the sky like this, like if you fly your drone into an airport or something, which could cause quite a bit of a hazard. And so you can imagine building algorithms that can go and, and catch malicious drones, for example. That could be one thing that's useful. But I don't think it ends there. If you were to be able to really conquer some sort of high throughput computing for embedded systems, you might even be able to build systems, for example, where um, here I'm showing, I found a YouTube video where our friend with a Ferrari is driving and, and barely goes through, almost an accident. So imagine, so this person gets lucky, not a lot of people get this lucky, but imagine systems that are very high throughput, 
in the sense that at the time of an accident like this, it turns on very high rate cameras, very powerful computers. Maybe it even shuts down the infotainment computer that you're using and uses that for computing um, perception, for, for perception and control to be able to nudge the vehicle just so slightly so that you can avoid an accident. So how would you be able to design controllers and perception systems and computing systems for these types of systems? And it's not just for sort of accidents and, and the action, but people are imagining sort of new aerospace systems that may actually require very high rate sensing and computing. And so I don't have videos for this, but I was kind of recently talking to a few people from Uber. Uh, they have this project called Uber Elevate. You may have heard of it. Um, it's kind of like an air taxi that they're planning. And they quickly realized that if they do some sort of like a quadcopter, like a scaled up version of a quadcopter, it's pretty inefficient. Ideally, you want fixed wing aircraft to be able to shuttle people around so that you gain some of the efficiency. Uh, but then unfortunately, it'll be pretty hard to land on the buildings because you would need some sort of like a landing space. And now they were thinking about, so this may sound a bit crazy, but they were thinking about how can you actually perch land on a building. So you imagine you're coming with a fixed wing aircraft, you just basically perch on uh, the landing pad. To be able to do these kinds of things, you would need very high rate sensing systems that can understand what's happening right at the time so that you can deploy the right type of controllers to land in a way that's, that's kind of efficient, if you will. And so my, my point is that um, as we build more and more powerful computers and powerful sensors, for the new next generation embedded systems, aerospace embedded systems, uh, there's a lot of applications that we could take a look at. Now the next challenge is how do we design these sensing systems? How do we design these computing systems? And how do we design the algorithms that come with it? Ideally, how do we co-design all of these three components together? So I'll talk about three different areas that you know we're doing work on integrating this kind of um, uh, very powerful computers into the stack on board or offline. I'll first start with the offline piece. Um, I'll talk about something that we call compressed continuous computing uh, to design controllers, estimation systems, and inference systems. Um, I'll start with that. This is more imagine using offline computing resources, like you may have a supercomputer, and how do you use that to design controllers in an efficient way? This is very similar to what people will do, for example, in scientific computing, computational design, or more recently, machine learning applications. So how can we use similar tools but to design control systems? So I'll be interested in control problems to begin with, um, typical stochastic optimal control problems, continuous time, continuous space. I'll be interested in problems that may have, for example, obstacles, which lead to non-convex constraints, complex objectives that may lead to nonlinear cost, or complex dynamics in such a way that analytical solutions don't typically exist. So we have to somehow utilize uh, kind of um, to compute controllers, the policies for these. We have to somehow utilize computational methods. Uh, there's a lot of applications, but I'd like to kind of show you how people solve these types of problems uh, that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, if you're not, I'll get to some of the algorithms that we're kind of designing, and it'll be clear at that stage. Basically, I, would, I have a system that has a state space and I have an input space, I'd like to find the mapping from the state space to the input space that you know, optimizes some, some cost function for me. Um, there's a lot of methods to solve these types of problems. So uh, one thing that people typically do is to take the continuous problem, discretize the problem into a Markov decision process, and then try to solve that Markov decision process. That is great, but unfortunately, the size of the number of states in a Markov decision process like this will scale exponentially with increasing dimensionality of your system. And I personally have worked a lot on like sampling-based methods and so on, but, but if you don't have any structure in your problem, even when you use sampling, often you have to pour samples into the state space. You need to fill the state space to recover the guarantees. The kind of methods that we've been proposing work as follows. We take the same problem, and instead of generating a full kind of a Markov decision process that relies on a grid, so the state number of states is exponential, we kind of generate a compressed version of that, like compressed as in data compression. And then we work on the compressed version to solve the compressed version, and then try to get guarantees on the non-compressed version of this. That'll be somewhat the idea behind this. And ideally, the kind of guarantees that we would like to get is that we'd like to find polynomial time algorithms for quote unquote low rank problems. More precisely, what will happen is that the guarantees will be such that we'll be able to compute, for example, an epsilon optimal solution. And the time it takes to compute it 
will scale with quote unquote the rank of the problem, but not the dimension. Um, let me tell you a little bit more, going a little bit more in depth. We're going to use something called tensor decompositions for this. And tensor decompositions are much like matrix decompositions, but in higher dimensions. So I'm sure, you know, when I talk about matrix decompositions, many of you are thinking about SVD. And the, the first lecture you learned SVD, I'm sure you've done this trick where you take this typical image um, and you kind of fit it into a matrix. Uh, you look at the SVD kind of uh, singular value decomposition of this, and you take the most significant singular values, and you try to reconstruct the image that way. And even with, let's say, 10% of the singular values, you can get a pretty good image in a way. I'm sure many of you have done this. And so what we will do is that we'll basically do something very similar. We'll, instead of working with matrices, we'll work with tensors. These tensors will be multidimensional, 10, 20, whatever you got. So it's a big grid, very large. Instead of using an SVD, we'll use specific tensor decompositions that are similar in spirit, but very different algebraically. One, typic, one particular thing that I'm going to utilize is something called a tensor train decomposition. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit how it works first, then I'll tell you how I use it. Um, suppose you're given a tensor, tensor A, that's indexed by D elements, I1 all the way to ID, so it's a D-dimensional tensor. Um, typically, if you want to just use, store this tensor as is in your memory, you would need N to the D um, elements where N is the number of discretizations in one dimension, and you have D dimensions. So it's exponential in dimension. Uh, you don't want to do that. A tensor decomposition was first proposed by uh, Osledets, Alex Osledets, um, more like a scientific computing literature. How, what you do is that you take this tensor and you represent it as a multiplication of D matrices. Each matrix is indexed by your typical index in that dimension, and each matrix is something like RK minus one by RK. So these are a whole bunch of matrices. For each one of these matrices, you have actually N matrices here, Whatever your index is, you can, there's a different matrix for every particular index. And if you want to get the value for I1 all the way to ID, you just multiply these matrices and you get the result. And so the storage cost is substantially reduced. You have a total of D matrices. For each dimension, you have N matrices, so N times D matrices here. And the matrices are R by R, roughly speaking. So you need N times D times R squared storage cost for doing something like that. If you can take a tensor and write it like this, then you have substantially saved on the storage cost. So what happens here is that essentially this structure takes a tensor and decomposes it over dimensions. So there's a matrix for dimension one, there's a matrix for dimension two, there's a matrix for dimension D. If your problem is somehow roughly decomposable over dimensions, this will be a great representation for you. And in many control problems, it may be like one state may be very different than the other state. They are loosely coupled, uh, which this will capture, but maybe they're not completely coupled. And so, um, like I said, it decomposes over dimensions and it basically works for problems that can be decomposed over dimensions like this. And if, if you can achieve this, the storage cost will be polynomial and you can do operations on it when you wanna compute, for example, the value of a certain index, it's also polynomial. So when I was working on my doctoral thesis, sort of this was back in 2011 or so, I was working on sampling-based methods and really kind of my whole life became the fight against high dimensionality and, and computational efficiency and so on. And, and at that time I was reading these papers of a completely different field in scientific computation and they were doing things like this. So they would take a function such as this, they would like to take this integral that you have the function here and then you, know, you have a field for the first dimension, field for the second dimension, field for the D dimension, and so on. They would decompose this over dimensions, and they would have D integrals, and they would evaluate them separately. If you need to evaluate all of the D dimensions all at the same time, you have to integrate over a D dimensional grid. You need to sum over a D dimensional grid. But if you can decompose all the integrals, it will be very easy. And so I was looking at these papers by Osledets, the title of the paper by Osledes and Trishnikov said, Breaking the Curse of Dimensionality, or How to Use SVD in Many Dimensions, in SIAM Journal of Scientific Computation in 2009. And I was looking at their paper, and they were discretizing every dimension by 1,000 points, 1,024, and they were able to go up to 200 dimensions. 
So 1,000 to the 200 is beyond any number you can imagine, way beyond the number of molecules and the number of atoms in the universe. And they were able to compute these kinds of solutions with theoretical guarantees. Of course, the reason they could do that is because um, clearly they're not in a situation where you know, P is equal to NP. The reason they can do that is because this function is low rank, has a rank that's low. Dimension is high, but the intrinsic dimension, which we call rank, is actually pretty low. And so they can apply these types of methods. And so um, it, it quickly occurred to us, how can we apply these things to control problems? So the first thing that we wanted to do is to propose a new decomposition that we call the function train. Um, it's an extension of tensor train, but to function domains. So what I would do is that I would take a function of d-dimensional variables, and I can write that as a multiplication of d-matrices. Each one of the matrix is function valued. So you can take f of x and write it down as a multiplication of um, sort of uh, d matrices. And each one of these are functions. And you can represent them however you want. For example, if you like Legendre polynomials, you can use them here. It's a completely continuous um, kind of way to, to represent it. And then what we did is that we looked at sort of how can we actually, if we write these in decomposition form, how can we actually compute with them? For example, one idea is that suppose, um, suppose I have two function representations, f of x and g of x. They are written in this function valued uh, decomposition form, and I'd like to sum them up. But I don't want to recreate the big tensor and sum it up and compress it again. I would like to sum them up in the compressed version. So we ended up sort of coming up with some quick ways to do these summation, multiplication, integration, differentiation operators, all in the continuous domain. So summation is kind of easy, for example. I claim that if you want to sum f and g, it's a new kind of a function train that I'm going to call h. There's h1, h2, all the way to hd. h1 is basically I take f1 and g1. These are matrix valued. I stack them right next to each other. HD is I stack them on top of each other, and HK is I stack them on the, on the diagonals like this, and I put zeros elsewhere. And I claim that this actually is the summation. You can check. Um, you can look at H of X. You can write the whole function train. You can start multiplying. As you multiply the insides, you're going to see that FK, FK plus 1, GK, GK plus 1 comes together. If you multiply everything in the inside, you would get something like this. And if you do the final multiplication, you would actually reach the result, which is what you want. And so it's a way to sum things up without decompressing them. Then this led us to the algorithm. So what we would do is that we would do something that we call compressed continuous computing. There is, if you look at the literature, there's something called compressed computing, which is exactly what Oscillates does. So they actually take these tensors and they do something similar. They don't have differentiation integration which we need, but they have the tensors, they can add them up and so on in compressed form. There's a literature on continuous computing. There's actually you know, literature on, for example, um, Alex Townsend and some of the others have looked at in scientific computing. How do you compute with, um, for example, Chebyshev functionals? So there's a MATLAB package called ChepFun. They use that for that. So imagine this kind of mixes the two. You can compete, com com compute completely in the continuous domain. You can take integrals in a continuous way in the compressed form, and you leave everything in the compressed form. The way the algorithms work is that often you have an iterative algorithm. This could be dynamic programming and so on. You start with a simple function that you can quickly turn into function train form. For example, all zeros when you're computing your value function. And as you iterate, as you do more compute, these structures get larger for two reasons. One reason they get large is because you actually put some computation. So you're, you're, you're putting some meaningful information. And you're also putting some entropy. There's a bunch of zeros you're adding in there. And then you basically compress it back down. This compression procedure is often called rounding or cross approximation, for which there's algorithms that we extend to continuous domain. So I'll tell you a few applications of this idea. So one is compressed continuous uh, computation for dynamic programming. So we're going to look at the same control problem that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we're going to start with a very simple cost to go function or a value function, all zeros. You're, imagine your control is zero, do nothing. And then you run one iteration of, of, of the Bellman equation. And so you know you get, now it's still in compressed form, but the, the function train is larger. 
and then you do rounding to compress it down. At the compression step, you can control the errors. So there's some error bounds that you can utilize in the compression step. The good thing is that um, all of these steps can be run in polynomial time. And Frank, ultimately, the amount of time that your algorithm consumes will depend on the rank of the value function that you're trying to compute, which frankly you don't know. Um, but if you hit a low rank problem, you will see that the algorithm sort of completes or runs the solutions very rapidly. If you're a high rank problem, you will see that the ranks kind of keep growing up and at some point the algorithm will have kind of uh, trouble keeping up with that epsilon error. Yeah, Claire, did you have? So it's, it's, it's not that you, it, you can always do step one, it's, but it may not be fruitful. It's like you may not be able to get a decomposition that gives you the, um, the kind of uh, low rank properties that you would desire. Correct, so what will happen is that you can always do the step one, and one thing that may happen is that if you have a complicated high rank problem that is not decomposable, you will see that you won't be able to compress it down. So in the compression step, the algorithm will tell you, well, I don't know how to do this in, in rank 50. So I can do it in a rank 100. And then the next step, it'll tell you rank 150. And it'll keep going this way. You can impose that epsilon error, but if you want to keep imposing the epsilon error, the, the ranks will keep growing, basically. And so, um, like I said, it's, it's, um, we're not able to, of course, conquer all possible, you know, the worst case type of problems. But well, we hope that there are some problems that are lower rank that we can kind of take into account. The way I see it, I think, is that this literature of compressed computing is quite similar to the literature for compressed sensing. So over at compressed sensing, there are fundamental limits like you know, Shannon sampling theorem. But it turns out that you have a compressible signal, then you can, you can reconstruct it uh, with very few samples, exponentially few. So Shannon sampling theorem is the fundamental limit, and you can you know, if, if you have the compressed structure, you can, you can reconstruct it. A priori, you don't know if the signal is compressible or not. We are in a very different domain for computation. Our fundamental limit is that these are NP-hard, and so we won't be able to do this for every possible problem, but it turns out that if the value function is low rank, then these algorithms will work. A priori, we don't know if they're low rank or not. And similarly, people use the same thing in, in, um, in um, scientific computing and elsewhere. Um, so uh, I don't want to go too much into details, but basically what happens is that um, you can, so the worst case, you have exponential time. Here, you can kind of show that you have polynomial time that scales with that rank. It's polynomial in rank. So your problem could be such that ranks grow exponentially with dimension. That can always happen, in which case this is an exponential time algorithm. But if it turns out that you have reasonable ranks, then you can get decent error bounds. And you can play with those error bounds to, to kind of keep them going. I'd like to give you some examples where we can apply these things. So um, we've looked at, um, we were talking to Ross Tedrake and they kind of uh, studied approaching problems. So you have, a, you have a, a, a fixed wing aircraft that's coming and trying to perch um, using some control in the elevator. As a flat plate model, it looks pretty complicated, but it's a seven state plate, uh, flat plate model uh, kind of pretty typical, and we took some cost function that they had over there. They were trying to compute a control that does the perching. We want to compute the optimal control, or at least whatever the, the dynamic programming value duration gives us. And just to give you an idea is that we're going to do something that we can later verify that it actually turns out that it's equivalent to taking the discrete grid and putting 160 points in every dimension. It's a seven-dimensional space. 160 points in a seven-dimensional space would, re would require you 2.6 petabytes to just store. So it's quite large. Just to give you an idea, if you wanted to basically put zeros on 2.6 petabytes on a gigabit connection, which is kind of roughly what you can get with copper wires, it would take you about a month to just put all the zeros so that you can start your computation. We can later see that basically the kind of things that we can do in a few hours would have taken for naive algorithms, very naive algorithms that you don't want to use, about a century to compute. So we can kind of compute these things that the solution fits in roughly one megabyte of memory. Uh, we can get an error bound that we know that we're so close to, so much close to what the dynamic programming solution can do. 
Um, it's, it's a control, a feedback control. You can stay from, start from every state and it basically tries to get you to the approaching condition and we can compute these things in a few hours. Yeah. Can you say uh, what are the types of systems for which this works ahead of time? Um, not really. So, I mean, at least um, not yet. And so we can prove that, for example, LQR problems have rank that scales polynomial with dimension. But that is something that you have an analytical solution for. You probably don't want to use computational methods for that. It would have been a holy, gr like a, it would have been very good to be able to prove and say, okay, for these set of problems, I can actually show you that they have low rank. Um, I don't think, I mean, maybe we haven't spent too much time on doing that, but we don't have that yet for meaningful problems. But let me kind of also tell you that if we could do that, it would be very powerful because nowadays, the way we can say that, okay, a control problem can be solved in polynomial time, usually we reduce it to a convex optimization problem. So this would be then another tool to show that a certain control problem is in P. It would be very powerful if we could do that. We tried a little bit. Um, didn't get very lucky and then moved on to other problems. Um, we can do pursuit evasion games. Um, I'm not uh, going to go into too many details, but um, very minimax value iteration. You have a Bellman operator at some point. You implement that Bellman operator approximately. Uh, you can come up with sort of similar bounds on the value that you compute for the game. And also, you know, you can sort of come up with um, Computational complexity results basically kind of showing that the same scaling, so it's polynomial in N, polynomial in D, polynomial in R. If, if R scales nicely with increasing dimension, you're lucky. Um, we apply these things to, for example, a pursuit evasion game, like a dog fight between kind of a simple model of a quadcopter and a simple model of a fixed wing evader. And so the, the relative dynamics would be seven dimensional. And I, I'm just gonna show you kind of the results. So uh, this is an infinite horizon uh, pursuit evasion game. And so we're kind of generating, so this is kind of a controller, like I said, you can, in the seven dimensional space, you can start from wherever and it'll kind of try to find you the maneuvers. And we can kind of see that even if you kind of start the two in a different direction, the kind of pursuer turns around and, and you get that nice behavior. And so that's an application to pursuit evasion games. Um, another application that we've considered is to kind of design controllers uh, that are sort of correct by design for to satisfy temporal logic specifications. We've looked at another aircraft example, like that is six dimensional, and we tell the aircraft to first go to say A3, and then either go to A1 or A2. So we can write that in temporal logic. You can start it from different places in the state space. So here are two initial states, and you can see different trajectories, but the same behavior. First go to A3, and then A1. Or if you start it from a little bit to the side, it first goes to A3, and then A2. So these kind of behavior we can also compute and embed in. We've tried a few other things. Um, we've looked at trajectory optimization using quadratic programming. We took the interior point um, sort of uh, method and we basically implemented it for the tensor train. Um, we looked at an application where you have a trajectory planning example. And in this trajectory planning example, what we try to do is imagine you're like some weather phenomena. You want to compute a very long trajectory that kind of interacts with this weather. And it's some sort of a quadratic programming that you need to solve. Uh, it's just that it's, the trajectory itself is very large and the objective function is kind of complicated throughout. Um, what we did is that we implemented an interior point method using the tensor train and we implemented an interior point method using MATLAB's sparse computing tools. And so this is, I think this is as good as you would have implemented if you're using MATLAB and you don't know tensor trains. And so we didn't use the naive algorithms but we actually have done sort of sparse matrices and so on. And um, we've looked at how it works if we increase the size of the trajectory. So this is kind of quite large trajectory sample. Uh, you can see that the storage costs at MATLAB kind of increase pretty rapidly. At some point, actually, MATLAB comes back to you and you try to do min prog and it tells you out of memory. Uh, but tensor train tools can, can keep going sort of uh, pretty far um, in, in solving these types of problems. Yeah. What is the tensor in that problem? So uh, we use something called a quantized tensor train. Um, so what you do is that you take the trajectory, uh, it's, it's a single dimensional, and you fold the trajectory on top of each other. And so then basically you can create a high dimensional structure. Um, this is not something we've invented, so people call these things quantized tensor train. 
Um, the good thing is that this looks at the correlations of the trajectory between this segment and that segment, looks at the correlation between this segment and this other segment and so on. And so it looks at all possible correlations, but sort of we get some interesting results. I'll just kind of go through a few different things and, and try to reach the conclusions, but um, we've looked at nonlinear state estimation. And so, um, so nonlinear state estimation problems, we've looked at uh, kind of basically doing the base integral directly. Uh, without, for example, instead of using an extended Kalman filter value, linearize, um, you just don't linearize at all in this case. You use something called a Gaussian quadrature. We've looked at, for example, can we estimate the state of a Lorentz 96 chaotic oscillator if you only observe the odd number states, but you don't observe the even number states at all. You were able to go up to 20 dimensions for estimating these kinds of things. Later, we decided to extend it to a more, I think, a more practical problem where we're kind of trying to estimate the distribution of a swarm. So you have a swarm, like for example, there's a bunch of birds flying. Imagine you set up a bunch of cameras around and these cameras are looking at the birds and you detect the birds. You don't have their IDs necessarily, but you can just say, there's a bunch of birds here. You're using maybe your favorite deep learning algorithm for doing that. And, um, and then if you take a bunch of cameras, like how can you actually construct sort of some sort of a distribution, basically by evaluating the base integral directly in this large state space to see how much we can scale these methods up. If you were to try to do these things on MATLAB like on existing tools, you get very quickly out of memory type of things, but compressed computing helps us scale up these types of methods. I kind of would like to conclude this part um, saying a few things. I think uh, there's a lot happening in this domain called tensor calculus. Um, it's, um, it, it's a topic that's studied in scientific computing uh, computational design, for example, people try and design aircraft and things like that use this a lot. Machine learning, very recently, so there's been a lot of uh, developments in using tensor methods in machine learning as well in a similar way. Uh, we try to understand how can we use that for control and estimation. And I think one thing we can bring in is efficient computation, but I'd like to believe that we contribute back this sort of continuous uh, methods. Uh, and these continuous methods, the, the nice thing I couldn't get a chance to explain is that you can integrate pretty easily or you can differentiate pretty easily that we utilize in a lot of the things that I've shown you before. Like for example, a base integral, you can integrate in the continuous domain. And so those are very useful and help us be a little bit more efficient. Um, more recently, we started kind of also look at, with one of my students, kind of look at how can we do not like tensor trains, but tensor rings or tensor networks and things like that to apply it to problems in, in multi-agent uh, planning and control. Uh, didn't get a chance to talk about that, but that's another uh, dimension that we're focused on. So I spent quite a bit of time on kind of trying to use very massive computational resources like people do in scientific computing or people do in, in, um, in computational design or machine learning and apply that to some form of computational design for control synthesis, for example. Um, now I'd like to switch gears and focus on onboard computing. So um, we also see a trend where very powerful computers are, are, are coming to our robots and, and, and we can use them on board. So how can we utilize them to the best? And so here I'm gonna switch gears and, and focus on a perception problem. Uh, suppose you are going very fast. You have a drone like the drone racing problem. It's going very fast. How can we develop perception algorithms or state estimation algorithms so that we can deal with camera images coming in super fast? I'm going to focus on a, a specific problem, um, a specific class of algorithms, usually called visual inertiometry with bundle adjustment. So what we do here is that we see this kind of a camera image and we would like to estimate the state of the camera, rather the motion of the camera looking at this image. The way this is typically done, there's a lot of methods, but there's one way to do it, is to find a bunch of features on the camera image, track how these features are going around, and then solve back how the camera traveled. And then in order to do that in a very precise way, build a very big optimization problem. In this optimization problem, we look at a trajectory of the camera. So that is represented by X sub i. We have landmarks, there are positions, there's things that we're seeing in the camera, there are 3D positions, L sub k. And I'm looking at, I have a camera model. If I'm in a certain position, I see a certain L k, where is that in that camera? This gives me from the get, I get it from the camera model, and I look at my actual measurement. 
And then I also have a measurement from the IMU and I have a dynamics model. Ideally, these should match and these should match. So of course, there's gonna be some mismatches, but I, I can solve this big nonlinear least squares problem to find out what, what, what was my trajectory and where are these landmarks in 3D. Okay, this is something that we can do. And this is utilized quite a bit. We asked the question, what if these camera images were coming in so fast that this problem is, is vast, it's large? How can you make this problem in a way that maybe you can make this whole process a little bit more efficient? And so we introduce what we call anticipation and attention. So what we're going to do is we're going to anticipate the motion that we're going to put in because usually we know the inputs that we're going to apply in the next few seconds. And we're going to use that trajectory to pick the right features so that we can minimize, for example, the covariance of our state estimation error. Um, the problem will look like this. Um, ultimately, we're trying to pick, we have a set of features, F, set of landmarks in a certain place. We'd like to pick a few of them to track. But I'd like to pick the best set of features to track in such a way that I can minimize my state estimation error or maximize the information that I collect at the end. I have several features and I would like to pick at most K because that's the amount of computation that I have. So how can I do that? Um, the anticipation will come here because let's suppose I know my trajectory going forward and I can take a look at the state estimation covariance matrix. I will work with the information matrix and I'll try to somehow maximize information. What I like to do for that is that um, there's certain things that you can do. Um, so I'm gonna take the information matrix. I'll also take into account how quality these features are. That's what people usually use. Uh, you can look at this matrix. You can, it's an information matrix. You can maximize the minimum eigenvalue, try to stretch it in some direction, or you can maximize log determinant, which is kind of like maximizing the volume of this matrix. Um, so this is the kind of problem that I, I'll take a look at, um, just to kind of um, put it out there. Either I will have this as the objective function, or this, and I'm trying to pick a set of K features out of all the features that I have, so that I maximize information on my state estimate. Um, the bad news, uh, this is an NP-hard problem, uh, not very surprising. Uh, you're trying to select a subset of features. You could try all possible subsets, which is clearly not going to be scalable. In the worst case, it's an NP-hard problem. Um, you can write down a mixed energy linear program. You can solve it. That'll give you an optimal solution. It'll be exponential time in the worst case. Uh, you can do some heuristics, like you can do some convex relaxation. Um, you can then round it back. You don't know if it's good or bad, but it'll be sort of polynomial time. You don't have performance guarantees. What we show is that it turns out that this problem is submodular. It turns out that in this context, both of these functions are actually submodular optimization functions. And then we can show that even greedy algorithms that you can kind of quickly rank all the features, top, pick the top 50 and use those, turns out that it can give you a certain performance guarantee. So you have like some constant level performance. And you're, you're seeing the algorithm, I'm not gonna show all the performance results, but as it goes through, these are the features that it detects and the, the, the yellow ones are the features that if I can play this again, the yellow ones, oops. So the yellow ones are the features that are picked. If I don't use the kind of the algorithm that we propose in a naive setting, it'll pick these features that are going to disappear pretty quickly. They're very high quality features, like these ones. They're very high quality features, but, but they're going to get out of the frame very rapidly. If you use the kind of algorithms that we proposed, instead of picking features from here, it'll pick features from there, which will stay in the view quite a bit longer. And this just comes out naturally from the algorithm. Remember, the algorithm is just trying to maximize information, and it turns out that it's picking features that have to stay in the view quite a, for quite a long time. So this is an example of it, yeah. Um, so this thing that I was showing you is from a public data set. I believe the frame rate is 60 frames a second. I'll show you in a second a faster frame rate application, which is like about 120. Do you do any frame skipping? Uh, in this one, the tracking doesn't skip any frames. The tracking doesn't at all. But what it does is that that optimization problem that I showed you, it actually runs on keyframes. So it's, yeah, so the keyframes are once every 0.2 seconds. 
in this particular implementation that I'm showing. So I'd like to kind of show you these algorithms running a little bit. Um, so I'll kind of tell you a few kind of you know um, drones and so on that we've built. So um, so so I'm going to show you some experiments with this drone. Um, so we've basically have been using the the NVIDIA Jetson uh, TX2 computer on board. Um, we had to kind of we realized that there was not very good sort of carrier board, so we designed one that has a USB-C connector, CSI camera lanes, and a, and, and an Xsense IMU on it. Um, we've also designed an FPGA board that connects to very high rate cameras, so we can connect this to a kilohertz camera, for example, to run camera very fast. Uh, the FPGA board connects back to the Jetson through a PCIe lane, so that you can, for example, select features here, pass the features to the Jetson computer, and then you can do like state estimation on the Jetson. These are the things that we would like to do. Um, and it's, you know, I, I kind of, I've been using this Mark Forge 3D printers to print uh, the body. I just realized Mark does the same, which is, which is I think, a good validation. That <laughs> I was thinking maybe this was crazy, but now that Mark is doing it too, so uh, it must be good. Excuse me, um, I'm trying to connect the dots to the part where Vivian Say I saw a couple shows this year. So this is... Yeah, so Vivian Say is... A, so we're a co-author on that paper, right, that, right. the paper that you just saw at Hot Chips. Right. Yeah. So I'm going to present that in a second. Oh, okay. Yeah, did you have a question on it, or? Uh, well, I, I, can, I can wait on that, but, but rewinding a bit, independent of computation, is there a pep talk here about why you wouldn't use a deep learning approach to this? Um, I think you, you very well could. Um, I think what would happen in a deep learning approach would be twofold. One is that we're still not there yet that we can use deep learning to do state estimation as precise. We might get there one day, but there's still work going on in that dimension. So it wouldn't be as precise state estimation with what we know right now. But at the same time, the other thing is that you will see in a second, like what you've seen in our hot chips paper, is that we can do these things if we build the chips from the ground up at very, very low energy, which right now would be very hard to achieve with over-parameterized models such as deep neural networks. So those are sort of the two things. Um, but other than that, sort of not necessarily. You could totally... Um, probably collect some data and, and try to see if you can. Do you have any quantization on, on how much more accurate you are? Than, than um, there are quite a few papers on how well you can do visual inertial odometry with um, deep learning approaches. Uh, we've worked on that area a little bit too. I'm not going to show here, but we've worked on that area a little bit too. I mean, these methods tend to be pretty precise. Like you can do usually um, point. 2% error is what's kind of like translational error. So you go, it's an odometry, it drifts. The amount of drift, drift is, could be like 0.1%, 0.2% um, about the distance traveled. Um, deep learning approaches are like, you know, 1%, 2%, and so on, uh, at best. Um, and those are very big models. That doesn't mean that they're going to stay there. You know, they could very well uh, yeah, keep improving. There's a lot of work in the way to produce the models, but I wanted to really talk, but is 1% to 2% accuracy? I mean, possible. Can it really hurt you in driving a drone around? A yeah, it's, it's very possible. Then again, you know, let me kind of tell you that our work here isn't visual inertial odometry. Our work is attention and anticipation, which you could very well use with deep learning methods. You can prune the deep learning methods and so on, but then I would ask you, how could you do attention and anticipation, for example, for a deep learning model? And I think that you may be able to use similar things. For example, in the kinds of deep learning visual geometry methods that we do, we often design things with like a GAN type network. So there's some features being found that are learned that are in the middle. It will be quite interesting to pick those features based on anticipation, for example. I think our work is on attention and anticipation, not necessarily model-based methods for visual geometry. That existed before. Um, and I will mention the work with Vivian in a second. So that's our joint work the paper that you've seen with hot, hot chips. I couldn't travel there, but VVN presented that work. Um, so um, we have a new motion capture laboratory at MIT. Um, so it um, it's took some politics to build it, but John and myself kind of put this out there now. So it's, 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 about, it's about 40 feet in one dimension, 80 feet on the other dimension, and 20 feet high. It's also like smack in the middle of campus, which is really great. Um, I have the netted half, and I, I like things that go fast, so I put a net. Um, and John Howe really likes multi-UAV type of approaches, so he actually doesn't like the nets because it makes it smaller. Um, but the point is that we can open the whole thing and, and cover the whole space. We have now 40 OptiTrack Prime 17W cameras, which also is apparently what Mark is using, so it turns out a good choice. Um, 
And so, so I think that um, we've had really good luck with these cameras. And we're now building another facility. It's a sister facility at the Hanscom Air Force Base. So this is, I'm kind of doing it myself. Um, we've just got like a hangar over there. It's 80 feet by 200 feet by 30 feet high. And we've just bought like 50 cameras, slightly different than this, to kind of use it. Um, what we'll do here is that um, I'll show you something that's kind of, um, we use it as a development environment. We fly a drone in this motion capture, so empty space. We take its position and orientation. We pass it to a, a supercomputer that's running a game engine that renders camera images and roughly speaking, passes the camera images back to the drone in real time in flight. So the drone is like, it's like as if you put, say, like a virtual reality goggles. It has real physics, has real inertial measurements, but completely synthetic extraceptive sensors. LIDARs, cameras, different configurations, all of them you can put. It'll look like this. Um, drone flies here, empty room, and this is what it sees. And so it's kind of getting this visual data, but real inertial measurements. And so now the question is that how can you fuse the two together, synthetic camera images and real inertial measurements, to find where you are and maybe try to go very fast. And so some of the things that I've shown you before and, and some of the others, new control methods and so on, and kind of put them together. And we started kind of in my half of the space, kind of without going into John Howe's unnetted half, which would be pretty hard to go into. <laughs> Using the net, um, how can we do like fully autonomous drone racing? And so the drone will fly, we're using the same visual inertial odometry type of algorithms to find our position. Um, we have a control algorithm. Uh, we've done some deep learning to detect the loops and, and this is kind of the result. Um, I think that you know, for a long time as I worked with UAVs, we were usually compute and sensing limited. I know it's still in virtual reality, it's not in quite reality, but, but for the first time I kind of felt like I was actually limited by the acceleration of the, of the drone. So we were reaching, so let me show you kind of my thing again. So in this environment, we were reaching speeds up to 15 miles an hour. It's, um, it's a flight space that's like 20 feet by, like roughly 30 feet by 30 feet, not the whole 40 feet. So maybe from here, to, like in an environment that's smaller than this, we were going like 15 or 20 miles an hour. And it feels very fast when you go. And we were limited by how quickly the, the, the drone can accelerate and decelerate. That was really our limitation, which was quite interesting to me. Yeah. Um, so, so we kind of, um, so, so everything is being computed on that TX2. Um, we've ended up designing some sort of like a, uh, I don't think you need to use deep learning for this, but we kind of designed like a, a deep learning detector. Um, we have the simulation environment so we can generate a whole bunch of different examples and we fed that in just to kind of see how that would perform. Um, but technically the rest of it, it doesn't have to be, but right now it is model based. So we have state estimation that tells the drone where exactly it is. We have a trajectory that we want to fly and then we just track that trajectory. I have skipped some of the things, like for example, our tracking controller has, um, we have odometry on the motor speeds. We can control them so precisely that uh, we know exactly how fast they turn. And we have very good models of these props. Given how fast they turn, we know how much trust they generate. And we kind of use that model, but sort of nothing else to control them. There's a bunch of things that, that went in there. But you don't know the um, no, for this drone racing application, what we did is that, um, so it was completely motivated by drone racing. We basically came up with a trajectory and we're tracking that trajectory. Um, obstacles, you don't necessarily need to know. I mean, you need to know the trajectory. Yeah, you, you need to, yeah, exactly, a trajectory that's conflict free. But you can change the environment, so we don't use that. We detect the loops, we know where the loops are. And then you can put a chair in the environment, take it out, so we don't necessarily map the environment. So visual odometry gets us from one loop to the other, and we know the trajectory, like a conflict-free trajectory that we have. It would have been great to be able to you know, program that sort of on the fly and so on, but we ended up focusing a little bit more on the drone racing domain where like we already even started kind of doing, if we are given a trajectory, for example, we have people who fly these drones, and we take the trajectory that they fly, and we fly the same thing. And we also try to change that trajectory slightly to improve it 
by optimizing with an experiment in the loop. So ideally, you would optimize with a simulation, for example. But here, we have aerodynamic effects, electromechanical effects, and so on that we don't model. We have it in real experiments. So we focused more on these kind of things, mainly motivated by drone racing. But admittedly, there's another line of work that we could have gone into and we would like to, which is what if we didn't know the environment and how can we plan as we go? We didn't do that. All that planning was done like, kind of offline then? Yeah, trajectory generation was done completely offline. And like I said earlier, we had some people fly it. We took their trajectories. We optimized it a little bit as well, kind of ourselves, to kind of beat them. I haven't, we haven't yet done the analysis, but we've also competed with some humans who are also playing in this virtual environment, and, and we are able to beat humans, like average drone racers. Uh, largely because we can take their trajectory and just kind of um, do the same. Wait, uh, I'm not really familiar with drone racing, but is it um, like head to head or is it time, one at a time? Um, they do a number of things. So they do like they run one at a time. Sometimes they run head to head. So this would be like running one at a time, for example. Um, I'll take two minutes to kind of show you a few other things that was kind of like the hot chips talk that they came out. This is joint work with Vivian Ze, who is uh, in RLE at MIT. He's a faculty member there. And so, you know, we talked about, you know, we know aerial vehicles. We work nowadays a lot on these micro aerial vehicles that have cameras on them, maybe GPUs and so on. But this is not the, the ultimate scale. You can even build UAVs that, are, that fit in your fingernail. So the question is, how do you compute for these things? One interesting fact is that something that's small, it actually takes about 100 milliwatts to lift itself. And the kind of jets and computers that I've shown you before, they're like 10 watts. So it's two orders of magnitude. Even if you could fit the computer there, it'll clearly drain the battery of any kind that you may have if you wanted to use it. Imagine it takes 100 milliwatts to lift yourself and go around and two orders of magnitude more so that you can turn on and off some transistors to understand what's going on. And so I think um, you know, in, in the near future, we would need to go into more and more specialized computing to be able to conquer applications like this. In particular, there is a path to almost design chips from the ground up to do the certain tasks that I mentioned before. Um, there's some interesting research going on in this kind of designing chips from the ground up, specifically for like machine learning applications, deep learning, for example. We're seeing that happen. And the key drivers are not anymore, you know, how many operations you go through, but one interesting thing is it turns out data shuttling is very important. You want to keep the chip busy all the time. And so how do you design the chip in a way that you utilize almost all the chip? The other thing is that you don't want to actually go out and access off-chip memory. That's very expensive. You want to use on-chip memory that's very limited. Such as these, there's a lot of other things that are kind of out there that you can utilize, but it's a very different domain, very different way to design, not just the algorithms, but the computing hardware that that algorithm sits on. And there's some literature already, but I think it's looking at mainly driven by the circus literature. It's looking at some of the primitive algorithms. I think we can come in and and take a look at more like domain expertise and, and, and build some things that are, uh, that are much more complicated than what can be done today. There's a lot of aerospace applications, like little drones is, is one thing. People are looking at chip-sized satellites. That's another thing. You can imagine kind of blimps that can stay in the air for like months, for example, because they can use very little energy. Um, there's also robots on the ground, like soft robots, the water glider, water, water striders, and, and many more. All of the applications that I'm listing here, they all require less than half a watt of energy for propulsion, for going around. And so you would need less than half a watt of a computer for the kind of the application to make sense to some degree. So the visual inertial geometry that you've seen before, so this was our hot chips paper. Uh, we've also presented in this, this in VLSI. Uh, we've just submitted a journal paper as well. Um, so it's a four millimeter by five millimeter chip. It does visual inertial geometry fully. Uh, including the bundle adjustment. There's a number of innovations um, that I'm not going to go into, but I can say that we can run it at 170 frames a second together with the inertial measurements. It would consume an average of 24 milliwatts. Uh, if you want to run it at 30 frames a second, it would consume two milliwatts. So that's the power that the chip would require. Um, I don't have too much time to go into details, but if you're interested, please come and ask me questions. And so I'd like to kind of conclude with a quick summary. So talked a little bit about computing for aerospace embedded systems. I'm very interested in safety critical aerospace embedded systems that have guarantees on, on things like correctness, efficiency, robustness, and so on. But I'm also interested in like high performance versions of this. How can we push them to their limits of 
embedded computers, how can we push them to their limits of physics? And there's, I think, a lot of different applications. One thing I talked about, how do we use like offline computational resources like a scientific computation literature would do. Another thing is this high throughput onboard computing. And a third area is like low energy onboard computing so that we can enable these kinds of things. I'd like to end with a few things. So one of them is I think this computing for high dimensional control estimation and inference I think is, is actually quite interesting. Uh, there's a lot of other communities out there using these very powerful computers. Why shouldn't we be able to use them for like control synthesis of like synthesizing maneuvers for aircraft, for example, why not? And so I think that's an interesting question. And if you ask that question, like how can we use the tools that they utilize? How can we bend those tools to our domain to utilize them the best? The other thing that I'd like to tell you, I think, is that there's a real convergence of sort of computing sensing hardware and software. And this is, I think, you know, in the robotics community, I myself, even as an undergrad student, have relied a lot on the consumer electronics to generate the computers for me so that I could put my algorithms and they would get faster. But if you look at consumer electronics industry nowadays, you realize that they're actually getting away from that for uh, whatever that might be. You know, Moore's law is slowing down or whatnot. But the point is that they are actually building a lot of ASICs to do certain tasks that are useful to them. So your phone, I don't know if you have an iPhone, an A9 chip might have a face detection ASIC that's embedded on it. And, uh, and you can still use that if that works out for you. But if you have a different task, you may find yourself having to generate that ASIC yourself, that whatever it is that you're interested in. And I think that's, that's actually a quite an interesting opportunity uh, for us as roboticists. I think um, I found that it's not just sort of some engineering to build a chip, but there's quite interesting, even mathematically deep problems to design these kind of things from the ground up. I just would like to finish with that. I couldn't get time to kind of talk about teaching. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>
somehow has provable guarantees on the perception system as well has been very hard. Falsification has been out there that I'm, I'm sure you're also kind of familiar with. So we can, we can falsify them. <laughs> we can show some examples where they don't work. Um, but having to come up with perception systems that can integrate with control systems that are correct by construction seems to be pretty hard. Yeah. Any last questions? Okay, let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank you so much for coming.